good morning everybody. Um, we're here today because the number of church buildings that are open and used for worship is falling. We've lost more than 3,000 in the last 10 years and a further 350 Church of England churches are at risk of being closed or demolished. Um, Scotland has lost 15% of its churches since 2000. Uh, the Church of Scotland is discussing losing more and in the, the Church in Wales, uh, 225 churches have been closed since the millennium. Uh, the National Churches Trust is a charity dedicated to reversing that spiral. Um, it fundraises in order to support churches and distributes grants. Last night it held its awards to recognise innovative work in architecture, maintenance and development. And I'm delighted to say we have the new chair of the Trust with us. He's Sir Philip Rutnam. He's a former permanent secretary at the Home Office until 2020. He would have seen many interesting things there. I wonder if he wishes he were there this morning uh, with all that is going on. Um, we also have representatives from the Anglican Church in Wales, the Presbyterian Church of Scotland, the Save the Parish Network in England. So, Sir Philip, welcome. Thank you for taking um, this time with us. Um, first question, you know, why on the day when we have a new prime minister and a nation in crisis, why is it important that we're talking about church buildings? Well, th thanks very much for holding this session and for um, uh, inviting me along. Actually, I want to begin with what happened last night, in fact, when we held the first ever national church awards bringing together a number of different awards which have existed for years now for different uh, activities that happen in church buildings and also creating a new church of the year award and what those awards showed was just what a range of fantastic things are happening in our parish churches our chapels and meeting houses right across the country all four parts of the uk present in strength what an impact these places are making on a daily basis, whether in um, running food banks or in welcoming visitors from all sorts of different backgrounds, whether in involving volunteers, the enormous impact that our church buildings, religious buildings have on the life of our country. We all know about the famous cathedrals, the most famous abbey churches, and they are fantastic and wonderful, but we have in the country no fewer than 39,000 places that are still in use for worship, every one of them the centre of a community. Those buildings comprise half, half of the most important buildings in the country from an architectural or historical perspective, and their contribution to the sense of place, the sense of identity, the sense of community across the country is simply immense. So you ask why at a time of political turmoil, um, perhaps that will be lessening now, but why at that sort of time we should be thinking about and caring about our religious buildings? Well, I would say it is exactly because they provide a daily focal point, a source of support and comfort and centre for countless communities in often very humble ways, but in a reliable and real way that we should be caring about those buildings, that they are, thing, they are a pl places that have been with us for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, provide enormous value to the communities that they are the centre of, and also happen to comprise no less than half of the most important built heritage of our country, all of which supported actually tipped overwhelmingly by the local people who um, who surround them. At first I thought you were going to do that politician's thing about um, evading my question, but you absolutely didn't. Um, so thank you for that. So uh, I think um, uh, some work that the Trust did a year or so ago um, suggested that the annual social and in economic value of church buildings is around 55 billion pounds. Now that makes my eyes water without making them water further too much with sort of lots and lots of um, um, accountancy. Um, can you tell me how that figure's arrived at? Yes, so I used to be, um, as you mentioned, a civil servant. In fact, I was an official in the treasury for, for 15 years of my civil service career. So I'm pretty familiar with the way in which um, this uh, this analysis was gone about and 
it's exactly the same approach as is used to try to assess the value of other services that government itself produces or provides or funds, such as health services or policing or something like that. Looking at the value um, using all the, the best information, uh, whether in terms of um, uh, the impacts on people's quality of life, uh, which is one of the techniques that's used in uh, health economics, for example, or whether it's by looking at what sort of income contribution people are willing to make where they make uh, actual choices about paying for paying for services and um, or not paying for services using those established economic techniques which are endorsed by the treasury in something known as the the green book which if you're a, a civil servant is a sort of doesn't have the status of the bible but for public administration is 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 a pretty iconic document using those techniques to try to assess what is the value in this case of the activities that take place in church buildings so what's the value um, of um, uh, providing food banks for example uh, and what would be the cost if food banks more food banks in this country than mcdonald's and as everybody on this call i'm sure knows churches have been absolutely at the heart of organizing those if those food banks weren't hosted in churches what would be the cost of trying to do something that was a replacement um not just food banks what's the value of the volunteering uh that uh churches uh, both rely on and provide now volunteering is very interesting because we know from lots and lots of studies that volunteering actually has a significant benefit to the people who are volunteers it raises that typically raises their level of engagement their level of enjoyment of life the quality of their life typically improves and churches depend on volunteers so it's not surprising that actually the value of that volunteering is to the life of a country is is huge when you look at these different types of benefit as well as the things that the sort of more conventionally traded things the maintenance take that take place in and around churches which you know some of which has to be paid for of course or the the cafes that some church churches operate when you look at all these things and you use the government's standard measures of well-being and how how much well-being is worth to people their being well how much is that worth you come up with these enormous figures now they are enormous figures but actually let's re reflect the fact that we have a network if i said to you i we could we could have in this country a network of 39000 buildings in use supported by volunteers um uh used um uh for worship but typically also used for a whole range of other activities nursery schools meeting rooms for alcoholics anonymous trusted spaces a network like that probably people from from scratch people wouldn't believe you but actually we have that network yeah. it exists yeah. on a daily basis it's worth a huge amount and i would say in fact that 55 billion figure is almost certainly an underestimate thank you for example um, it doesn't account to the value of heritage itself i wonder um i'm sure we'll hear from other people about this but i wonder whether very briefly you could outline the challenges facing churches in finding funding. They come to so, you for grants, but there's not a great, you know, there's, there's a limited amount that you can do. But what are the key challenges facing them at the moment? There are a number of challenges, of course. I mean, there are challenges associated with the fact that congregations during COVID got smaller. And while patterns are different in different parts of the country, in different denominations, they're only in some places only slowly recovering. So there are challenges like that. The biggest single challenge in relation to buildings, I would say, is that we have a backlog of repairs, including major repairs. For the Church of England alone, that's estimated at about a billion pounds. And that means that unless that backlog, which there'll be similar backlogs in other parts of the country, unless that backlog is tackled, these buildings will slowly deteriorate and that will make it even harder to get them into good condition, sustainable condition in the future. We have the National Lottery Heritage Fund that used to have a ring fence scheme for places of worship. And what, what sort of cutbacks have there been in the sort of heritage sector which make life even harder than it was? 
Yes, you're right to refer to the National Lottery Heritage Fund, uh, which, as you say, used to have a scheme specifically for, for, for places of worship. And in fact, that reflected the fact that you go back to the 1970s, um, successive governments had, through whether through the lottery or other schemes, um, provided specific support for our historic places of worship. This is That's particularly true in England. In Scotland and Wales, I think there are some additional challenges. And that specific support came to an end in, in 2017. And since then, there's been no systematic and structured support for places of worship. There was very importantly, the Heritage Stimulus Fund, which in England provided a significant amount of funding for um, one-off repairs. And we were very pleased to help uh, deliver some of those grants uh, last year. But now, um, uh, if you're a place of worship, you may be a grade one listed building, you may be grade two star, you may have the most fantastic collection of um, heritage that you have to look after. You may provide the most tremendous services to the local community, but no matter how small you are, how challenged you are, you have to apply if you want a lottery grant alongside any number of other lottery applicants and the record of churches actually in and places of worship in getting grants from the lottery since 2017 has been very, very few have managed to get those grants because they are typically very small organizations up against organizations which are able to employ professional um, uh, fundraisers, professionals who can write grant applications and, and there's some questions about the criteria. So with the end of the dedicated support, which ran from the 1970s to 2017, we found but the backlog of repairs has continued to grow. The financial position of churches has become much more challenging, but their community contribution, the heritage that they look after, have only become more important, as shown, for example, during COVID. Right, very, very briefly, I, I am in fact a magician, and I have found you half an hour to put you back in the treasury in your new role, um, and you've got a meeting with the chancellor. Um, I think it's Jeremy Hunt still, but you know, who knows? So what, what, what are you going to say with your new hat on about the partnership that there needs to be with government in the maintenance of these buildings? I'd say that these buildings and what happens in these buildings provides one of the cheapest forms of support for society, including the most vulnerable in society that exists in our country. And government could achieve, if it put quite modest amounts. To be honest, in the scheme of the Treasury, they're in the, they're in the, they're in the roundings, absolutely in the roundings of, of uh, the arithmetic. If you put quite modest amounts into um, looking after these buildings in a partnership, in a partnership with local communities, a partnership with denominations, if you did that, you'd get a triple win. You'd get local communities, which had renewed sense of pride in their um, uh, in the focal point, um, the magnificent building at the heart of the community um, and its heritage, you'd get a legacy of heritage which could last for the next 100, 200 years, and um, you would get um, that um, uh, well-being for the people who may not be members of the church but might come there because they're mums with a newborn a baby or a toddler, or there's somebody who's vulnerable and desperate, uh, really on the margins of society. We see again and again that it's churches and church buildings which are trusted and able to reach those people. So you would get, Chancellor, a triple win. And um, the number doesn't need to be very big, but you can make a very big impact. Can I bring Scott Rennie in? Because he's got a, if you'd like to unmute yourself, Scott. Scott's from the um, uh, Church of Scotland, Presbyterian Church of Scotland. And, and you just put a question in the chat box. I wonder if you'd like to put it directly to Sir Philip. Yes, uh, thank you, Rosie. So Philip, I suppose from a denominational point of view, one of the challenges we feel we have is that often the channels and avenues for congregations locally to access uh, grant funding is quite difficult because often, I think they feel, maybe sometimes we feel that there's a, a kind, it's more difficult for faith groups. 
because there's a sense in which often one's status as a faith community actually is, and often it can work against you uh, in terms of accessing funding. So I'm quite curious uh, as to what we can do as, uh, you know, the National Church of Scotland as, uh, as one of the denominations to help the Trust uh, have that conversation with government in which we both tried to explain, as you've explained today, the, the benefit to the whole of our communities of these buildings and what goes on in them, but, but also to try and uh, free up that access to grant funding. Uh, you know, not to take away from our responsibility for buildings, but to say to the government, they, they really provide a benefit. We need your help in terms of a more, well, in terms of a better uh, environment sphere as far as grant funding. So I think it's a really good question, Scott, and I completely agree that there's a bit of a, you know, a bit of a gradient, a bit of an uphill slope that has to be overcome here. I think COVID has made a difference, actually. I th I've, I've sensed in some bits of government, uh, national government, uh, um, not just at UK level, but devolved administrations, also in some local authorities, that historically were really quite secular mind, very secular minded, a bit doubtful about working with faith groups, the practical experience of COVID, the realization that uh, churches, faith groups have extraordinary in their term reach, the ability to reach people that public institutions typically can't, that has really made a difference. There's a moment that we can capitalize on associated with COVID. Um, and that's, that's, that's one bright thing coming out of a very dark time. I would say in general, my advice on, on engaging with organizations, big organizations like government is two things. So the case study, the example, the practical story, um, and especially if you can get take people out to see them, they make all the difference in bringing to life something which can seem abstract and helping to overcome um, uh, that kind of, you know, often ignorance, to be honest, uh, not knowing about things. And then the second thing is, is spending time talking to people, realizing that, I mean, these are people with good intent on the other side of the table, almost oh, universally good intent, limited time. So typically you want to make things relatively accessible, easy to understand but try to invest in the relationship, build of the relationship. And that, that could be very difficult for individual churches, I know, but I think the denominations have a big role to play. Organizations like ours, which are independent. Um, we're not actually a faith charity ourselves, um, though we're obviously adjacent to faith. We, I think, can also play that role, but we need those examples and we, we need you know, people who can, who can help it to amplify our message. So use COVID, the fact that the experience of COVID matters, the case study, the example, and spending time investing in the relationship. The government has got um, a levelling up agenda, uh, last time I looked it did, and um, it wants to address the regional economic disparities. Now you've not got masses of money to give out, but I just wonder whether regional inequality is a factor when you are deciding where you put your money. You know, there's actually a really interesting correlation between the um, regional inequality factors and heritage at risk. So we do, in our, in our grant allocation, we look at relative deprivation. It's, it's part of our sort of grant making criteria. But actually, interestingly, if you look at something like the heritage at risk register, you will find there are remarkably few church buildings at risk in some of the home counties. What a um, surprise. Where, the, where the, the heritage is most at risk, tends to be in quite poor urban areas, some in London, but many in, in our northern cities or in towns, coastal areas, and in, in some of the most isolated rural areas, and often actually also the, the less wealthy rural areas. So there's actually, it's not a perfect correlation, but there's quite a strong link. If we want, where we need to focus our resources to support the country's heritage for the long term, is pretty well linked, pretty closely correlated, not perfectly, with tackling deprivation, with tackling marginalization, with tackling communities that are very isolated. And of course, you, if you can do those two, two things together, you go back to my triple win that I was trying to pitch to your hypothetical chancellor. 
Thank you. Now, um, I'd like to shift the conversation a little bit to, um, you know, the priorities of churches, because obviously churches themselves are largely responsible for their own sort of maintenance and buildings. Um, I'd like to um, bring in um, Alex Glanville, who is the head of property in the church in Wales, Anglican Church in Wales. Um, um, Alex, I don't know um, what your reflections might be on what you've heard so far, but I mean, I suppose one of my questions is that in September it was announced that the church is going to spend £100 million of capital reserves to help churches serve their communities more effectively. I'm just wondering how much of that money, I don't know if you know this, goes on actual sort of fabric and, and maintenance and church toilets, um, as opposed to um, mission posts and that, that sort of thing. Well, the I think, uh, thank you, S simple answer to that is we, we don't know at the moment. Uh, we've identified um, reserves that we believe we can safely release, but this is a one once in a generation, if not any generation opportunity to invest some money uh, that we've saved up over an awful long time. Um, and the focus of that is very much about uh, growth and about evangelism and trying to take the church forward into the future. So it's not, it's not identified as a let's spend it all on buildings fund. It's identified as money to invest in our future. And some of that inevitably will involve works to buildings, but the works to buildings comes out of the activities. And I think very much the focus of our thinking is how do we get the church, local churches doing more, uh, engaging with more people? Because in many ways, I think, we don't have a building problem, we have a people problem. Mm. And in and with tiny congregations in some cases, or, or not necessarily tiny congregations, but very tired congregations who need inspiration, they need some help, uh, and this money may well help them to think of new ideas and to develop new opportunities. So that's very much the focus of that funding, is, a, is an opportunity to try. And if, if money is the problem, we need to, uh, we've got a bit of money to try and help grow the church, relaunch the church, uh, develop new ideas at, at ground level, some of which will include building work, of course. You, you talk about um, tired congregations and tired people. How much of that tiredness comes from, you know, the burden of having to raise money? I don't know if you have the same system as the Church of England has of a, a congregation doing a parish share and putting money into the diocese. Um, you know, that's that's a great burden for some congregations is that something that operates in Wales as well yes i mean in a similar in a similar way um in the sense it's that local congregation contributing to the costs of the work of the church and particularly the employment of clergy and so forth um and you know i'm sure that's part of the uh, the, the challenge that each local congregation has but i think it's um I think it's the simplest thing. They're tired out because of money. Uh, they're tired because it's hard work um, looking after these places, looking at, uh, trying to uh, engage with communities when that can feel like something that you're you're quite alone in that task. So, and a lot of our people, it has to be admitted, are at the older spectrum of life. So, you know, it's a tough job, um, and that's where we want to try and help them in uh, rethinking the way forward and introducing new ideas and perhaps employing some people to help them in cases where we think that that's that's going to be helpful. Can I bring in um, Conta, Conta Hamilton? Conta, you're a, um, a member of the Save the Parish Network, launched a year ago, I think, um, trying to sort of, uh, well, say, save the parish. Um, I mean, you represent congregations who feel that um, the parish is under threat partly because of the mission and funding priorities of the Church of England. Am I, am I right? I don't want to take, put words in your mouth. I mean, tell us a little bit about your concerns about um, the parish. And at the centre of every parish is a building. You're right. It, it, there is a building. And, and the reason I'm here is that I feel quite strongly that it should remain there. Um, Financing these buildings has become more and more the lot of the local parishioners, and they are tired. I think it's a really good expression. They're they're fed up being. Um, they are volunteers. They're not paid. Most of them. The vicar is paid if he's lucky. Um, <laughs> the the church, and, and I think Save the Parish is based really on on a cry for help to the upper echelons of the church and. Um, 
so far we've raised the profile of it but haven't really had a result uh, in terms of feeling that church hierarchy is listening um, what do you want them to do what how do you want it to respond well Finan i'm talking about finances as much yes as well let, let me go through the finances a little bit um it's actually on the stp website and i have to say that everybody uh, that i am not the person who should be talking to you about this because i'm on the sidelines but it was very short notice and i'm here um we we have a bevy of of retired volunteers. Can I just say that you've run a charity in London and you've worked in the city. I think that makes you perfectly qualified to join us. <laughs> Thank you very, thank you very much. But I'm, I haven't been at Save the Parish since the beginning. But we we do have a lot of people who know about crunching numbers, and all the numbers that we've produced so far have come from public statements. The Charity Commission has a lot of accounts from all the individual charities within the Church of England. And uh, so far, the Church of England hasn't really complained too hard about the numbers that we've produced. Um, and it looks to save the parish in general, uh, the, the steering committee, that in fact, there is money. It's just a question of where it's spent. And at the moment, it's being spent in places which is not supporting the local parish at a time of great difficulty. And we would argue perhaps that it, more of it should come down to the parishes. And if, if I explain it to you in in a nutshell, um, there's, there's 10 billion of, of, of um, the commissioner's money. There's 5 billion at the diocesan level of, of a state glebe land, which, which yields something in the region of 500 million a year in investment income. Um, the parishes themselves produce 318 million, which is the parish share that you've mentioned before. And the diocese take that money and then they give it back in the form of paying for the vicar and his pension and his, perhaps his um, vicarage. So they spend in total 300, 363 million, which, which means they have to find 45 million. Now, if you go back to the 70s, the diocese were given all the glebe lands and some other legacies. So they do have 129 million pounds a year from glebe lands, which used to be owned by parishes and are no longer. And to give 45 million pounds back at a time of hardship, we argue is, is quite small beer. Hmm. And we think there is more money available, it's just not coming. Do and you this, think that you and the, the National Churches Trust might be able to put a joint case to the church commissioners to get more money? Um, well, we've tried that. And we've tried to see if we can get money direct that doesn't go through the diocese because they seem to sit on quite a lot of money that, you, that we think should be coming towards the parishes and isn't. And perhaps that is something we could look at. Um, we have tried. Um, most people who have tried have got rather disillusioned because the church doesn't really appear to be listening too hard. I mean, they are listening away. They've produced another 100 million, which you mentioned earlier on. But anecdotal evidence would imply that, that you can only go for that money if you are prepared to dance to the tune. So if you're looking after a church which has got 16th century investments that need to be looked after and you've raised money for the last 15 years and you need a little bit more because the moths have been in you can't get it you know you're you're they're much more at the moment it appears to me to an outsider to be prepared to fund plants in in urban in fact the sdf funding that we've had for the last two or three years has, has been exclusively reserved for um the urban centres and not the rural parishes and, and sometimes for new builds as well and for new builds which, which is fair you know there's room for everybody and everybody likes to worship in different ways there's nothing wrong with that it's just that when you've been squeezed post-covid and you're not getting a penny extra unless you dance to their tune um it's hard you know and they are these people are tired and and we don't believe that that you know locking little old ladies in in churches until they agree to the bishop putting their perfectly functional church in some cases into a large benefice of five to ten and make, some of them are 27 people yeah. large. it doesn't work yeah. they, they seem okay. to cut vicars or not train enough vicars um, to be able to carry on this business so we, we have a problem where the people are very tired at the moment they don't have enough money but they're also being the fundraiser the reason churches get money is because they have a vicar who coordinates it all. So, Philip, um, is, could you team up with Save the Parish and go to the church commissioners and add some welly to their case? Well, I mean, Save the Parish is, is obviously it's, it's an important campaign, but it's a, it's a different different campaign and, and uh, uh, a sort of a, a rather particular 
and it's a particular particular cause we we speak try to speak for the interest really of church buildings of all denominations across all parts of the uk uh, urban areas as well as rural areas multi church multi parish benefices as well as single um single parishes um i think though that conta makes a very important point about um resources and i and i foresee that in that sort of conversation that i i you know imaginary conversation that you 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 put me in with the with the chancellor there is an important question um about uh, resources in our churches very interested to hear about what the church in wales has done um and will be very interested to follow those developments i was also very heartened i have to say by what the the church commissioners recently announced in terms of new funding settlement for the next few years and the greater emphasis being put on buildings i, I think there is an important question about resources and i, and I suppose my message uh, if I can be so bold, my message to the leaders of our denominations in, in the UK would be to say, recognise, recognise the value that church buildings have in serving not just um, the, the regular worship, critical, absolutely critical that that is, but also in conveying a message to the wider community, people who may never never yet have gone through the doors of the church a message to them that the church is there and the fact that the building is there the fact the building is cared for the fact the building is valued projects a message about the value of the church and what it is there to offer the whole community including uh, the famous quote from william temple which i can't quite call to mind about how the church can be there most for the people who do not do not attend it. So okay. I think there's an enormous value in church building, uh, which we would definitely want anybody who believes in that cause to 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 sort of ally with and to to talk to. Thank you. Um, we've got the Church of Scotland's principal clerk here, the Reverend Fiona Smith. Um, Fiona, um, the Church of Scotland is looking at some more closures. Um, how how's that come about? How might you prevent it happening? Do you want to? Um, prevent it happening or do you see it as a, a evil necessity as it were? Thank you very much, Rosie. I echo certainly what others have said and, and very heartened by what Sir Philip has been saying about the importance of our churches at the heart of communities. We are the National Church of Scotland. We operate a parish system. It is part of our constitution to serve all the people of Scotland, uh, the ordinances of faith and the service that thousands upon thousands of people voluntarily give day in, day out across this land. We also see, as has been mentioned in terms of England and Wales, the discrepancies between rural areas and urban areas. We also have the complexity in Scotland of our very interesting history. We in the Church of Scotland were created in the Reformation of 1560, and um, we're quite feisty, so we've had a few arguments along the way. And one of the results of those arguments in coming back together, most notably in 1921, which in the room I'm in is the principal clerk's office, is all the records of the, of the, the different uh, wings of our church uh, coming back together again. Um, and that phenomenally important message of us uniting as Presbyterians in 1921 um, was the result um, of much hard work and much commitment to the people of Scotland. But the result was we have an awful lot of buildings. Mm. We will have small towns where there may be three or four church buildings. Um, and so what we have been looking at is looking to uh, our mission in terms of church buildings overseen by our general trustees, of which Scott Rennie, my colleague, is the vice chair of general trustees, um, is looking at making sure that our church buildings are the right are the right spaces in the right places for all the reasons that have been spoken about today. Church buildings are in the heart at the heart of the community. We've seen that in COVID in particular, um, and I'm not long from being in the parish, and that certainly was the whole raison d'etre of the congregation I had the privilege to to lead in Inverness. But it is a bit difficult time. Um, it's a difficult time for communities. Uh, congregations are tired. All of the responsibility does rest on them so often and funding, as Scott has already spoken about, is difficult, over, particularly in recent years, um, to access as it's a faith community. 
but also, as Philip said, that often we are competing against other charitable sectors where they've got dedicated fundraisers and we've got, you know, volunteers and sometimes the demands are too great. So that's an important point. We are committed to the history of Scotland as well, for we are part of it and for the transformation of communities and ensuring that we spread the resources that we have of the church in both terms of people and finances, um, that, it is, that it recognises the disparities between different areas. And finally, to say um, we are going through a process in Scotland, the General Assembly passed it last year, um, of called presbytery mission planning. Presbyteries are similar like to diocese. And we're putting mission at the heart of our decision-making process. And that's about people and about our buildings. Again, going back to um, buildings being in the right place, right place and right space. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the part of the process. It's joined up process. Um, and absolutely, if you quantify the value of the services that this church here is, is across the whole of the United Kingdom, it is phenomenal. Um, um, but we all need to work together and we need help as well from uh, from uh, charities like the National Churches Trust and the government needs to be able to start realising what a contribution that we have. On the day of lockdown in March 20, 2020, uh, by 11 o'clock, Highland Council had given me clearance to keep my building open because of the essential work we were doing. So I have lived experience of that. And yes, um, the church today is still very much needed across our land. I mean, I think the, the point that stands out before what you said is about the right place, the right spaces and the right places. I mean, I started this briefing with, you know, a sort of litany of, um, you know, church closures. Not every closed church is a, a tragedy or a disaster, is it? No, and, and, and we, of course we understand this is a vast, vast number of buildings. There will be changes, there will be new buildings opening as churches, there will be some buildings that need to close as churches. It has, it has, um, uh, the number of churches as total buildings used for worship has come down. Um, it, it may well continue to, it will continue to adjust. But I think it's very important to see that um, change overall can be positive, that also we can reconcile, we can bring together some of these different goals. So um, uh, often a historic building um, actually can be adapted in such a way that it can accommodate. Um, uh, we, we spend quite a lot actually in, in the National Churches Trust in, in supporting putting in kitchens and toilets, um, which can be done in a way that is completely compatible, sympathetic with historic listed buildings and can maintain that historic building at the heart of the community. And I think as we, as we think about whether it's the heritage perspective or the long-term sustainability perspective in terms of uh, reducing the, the carbon footprint, um, we should be trying to think about how we make the very best use of the estate that we have. So, of course, there will be changes, but I would encourage all denominations to think about how they can make the very best use of the buildings they have, including the historic buildings, which often convey that meaning, a sense of identity in place to the whole community, whether or not the people there are regular attenders at church. We're getting more and more uh, religious buildings, of course, which belong to other faith communities, which are going to have their challenges, you know, the synagogues and mosques and good bars and so on. And I just wonder, um, where's the help for them? Um, this may not be a question for you, um, but um, I mean, a, a national religious buildings trust, um, which sort of gives us some recognition of, of what they're doing in the centre of the communities that they are as well, um, doesn't seem to me like a bad idea. So the National Churches Trust, our focus is on places that are used for Christian worship. Um, I know that, uh, I'm afraid I'm not an expert, but there are, uh, I think, other organisations that help to support Jewish places of worship. I, I don't know about um, Sikh and Hindu. Uh, they generally be much newer buildings, of course, and probably not necessarily have quite the same legacy of challenges as something from, um, you know, Norman times. <laughs> Um, I'm going to close fairly soon, but um, I would like anyone who, ha well, who would like to say more or who hasn't spoken, please put up your hand. Um, I've got another really horrible question for you, um, Sir Philip. So shall I give that one first while everyone thinks about what they might want to say? Okay, so here it is. 
Uh, my spies tell me that you're a member of two congregations, one in the city and one in, the, I think, the southwest rural churches. And I'm going to say that one of those has got to close. Mm. I'm sorry. Um, how, how do you make the decision about which one it is? Uh, well, I, I am going to say that's not actually um, uh, a fair question. I, I, I'm or, quite aware of that. There isn't, there really, in that case, there really isn't a trade-off. Um, both churches are at the centre of their communities um, and both serve quite different communities. One's in Herefordshire, very rural, and one's just literally 50 yards from where I'm sitting here, right in the middle of very, very mixed urban inner London. And one thing I would say is that we need to be very, very thoughtful about um, cloak, uh, about churches and um, closing, particularly ones which have got this strong role in providing a sense of identity in place and deep links into the past. We're a society which values its past, which is a society which gains um, a sense of um, presence and purpose with the past. I, I used to be involved in transport, one of the things I've spent a long time working on in transport. And we were busy, when I was in transport, busy dealing still 10 years ago with the legacy of beaching, with the oh, fact yes. that a lot of railway lines were closed in the 1960s for ostensibly very rational business-like reasons without actually enough regard to the communities that they served. And now, now, government has been spending, national and local has been spending billions of pounds looking at how it can reopen some of those lines. Mm. If they had only been kept going, more of those lines had been kept going, they would have found a new purpose as, as transport patterns change, as people's expectations of how they get around change, and as population change. Now, we, we had one of the awards yesterday in the, in the National Church Awards, our friends vote was for a church which almost shut in the 1970s. It was on the closure program, All Saints will be in Norfolk, but it wasn't closed because there was a campaign, sufficiently strong campaign, a bit like some of the campaigns that sold railway lines going to the far north of Scotland. And now it still serves the community. It is in, it needs, needs a bit of money, which we have provided for some roof repairs, but it is a center of the community as well as an absolutely magnificent, absolutely magnificent grade one listed medieval building. So let's not lose what we have. Let's not sleepwalk into another beaching for our churches and chapels and meeting houses across this country. Let us treasure what we have and make the very most of it for all sorts of reasons, including the enormous value these buildings have for our communities. I'll ask you a, one nice question in a minute. OK, but first, let's just have um, Alex Clanville put his hand up. Hello, Alex. Hi, yeah, I just, just wanted to say on the question of church closures, um, really, that I think traditionally we, we kind of had a system where you, you either had your church open or you closed it, and there was very little in between. And so we're spending a lot of time and a lot of creative thought in looking at trying early thinking about future of buildings, discerning options, discussing ideas, consulting wider communities, and really trying to look at a whole range of possibilities for these buildings, because it's not just as simple as saying, it's either open as a whole place of worship looked after by a local congregation, or it's closed and sold off. And I think that creative thinking is absolutely key going forward to find new ways of supporting these buildings as community assets. And that's something we're really working very hard to do. Thank you. And Scott, uh, Scott Rennie from the Church of Scotland. Yes. As we go through this exercise of uh, deciding, you know, what we need going forward for, for buildings, I think one of the learnings for us as a denomination is that Sometimes I think we have uh, been too precious about our historic buildings in that for various reasons, we haven't allowed them to evolve and adapt and change. And so remain relevant in the sense of both their usefulness actually for mission, but also in terms of what they can provide to the wider community. So I definitely think, uh, I agree with Alex, that we definitely have to think more creatively about our use of buildings. Uh, particularly historic buildings. 
But also, we have to think about different models of stewardship going forward. And I think that has to include commercial uses for historic buildings in particular, and different ways that we can find to substitute. Because it seems quite obvious to me that the traditional model of stewardship for the last 100 years, where a congregation is giving support that building alone, I think is not going to become feasible. And I think if we find different ways for community buy-in, and particularly in terms of actually contributing to the cost of sustaining these buildings, feeling some sense of wider ownership for these buildings, it is going to be uh, easier to sustain them long term, which is ultimately what we all want to do. Thank you. Now, uh, this is a nice question, Sir Philip, and it's an important one because we haven't heard from anyone uh, from the Fourth Nation, Northern Ireland, um, here today. But um, it was a church in County Tyrone that won the Church of the Year Award at your awards last night. Um, can you tell me what it is that they're doing right and why they got the award? Yeah, so the church that won the Church of the Year Award uh, is St McCartan's, also known as the Fourth Chapel. Uh, which is in a small village called Ocker in County Tyrone near in the Diocese of Clocker. Um, so rural church. Um, which denomination? Roman Catholic. Um, I don't know whether McCartan's remembered in the Church of Ireland. I've never heard of him, I have to say, yeah. But he, he was, a, he apparently, he was a disciple of St. Patrick who founded a, a, a monastery. So what they got right, this is quite a modest church, um, though it contains some fantastic heritage, fantastic stained glass, and it's got lots of literary associations, but it's quite a modest church deep in the countryside. What they've got right is care for the building and the heritage and using that as a way of welcoming visitors from all faiths and none into their building and into the associations of the building. So making a link between the building and um, people from all sorts of different backgrounds, fantastic involvement of local volunteers of all ages uh, in caring for the building and the level of community engagement and support more widely. So really it's just a shining example of a quite a modest rural church which has got its relationship with its wider community in from all we could see as judges in exactly the right place and making that link between the history and identity of the building and the sense of place, the sense of purpose in what has obviously been historically quite a challenging part of the world. So it's really just a, a wonderful example. And it was, to be honest, very moving hearing from the, uh, the priest who looks after uh, St. McCartan's, what it meant to them to be Church of the Year. Thank you. Um, I've got two other comments or questions and then we'll close. So we've got about five minutes. So it Fairly briefly, please. Ruth Peacock, the Director of the Religion Media Centre. So um, I, I've got a question, I think, for uh, Alex Glanville um, uh, about Wales. Um, and it's, um, it's, a, it's a personal experience of a church that has been under threat of closure. Um, it's in Llandequin near Harlech, which there's been a kind of Christian presence there since 500. Um, but it was built for the farms around and, you know, the village is, is below the hill. But it's the, it's the kind of scene, if you were there, where you have a moment of transcendence when you're outside the building and, and seeing the view. And what happened there was, you know, a sniff of, um, of closure. The local community rallied round. And I suppose this is a bit wider than Wales now, but what causes a community to rally around a church when it's at risk of closure? We, we had... Um, um, a lecture recently by uh, Linda Woodhead talking about the future of religion in the UK. You know, so affiliation to organised religion is going down. British Islam is flourishing, and and then there's this category that she called magic. So mindfulness and and yoga and meditation, and people search through tarot and astrology, and this is a flourishing kind of expression of. Faith. I, I just uh, these are random thoughts. I suppose my question is, um, when a, a church organisation uh, looks on a spreadsheet and says these particular churches uh, therefore have to be threatened with closure, how can it loosen its rein on the building or loosen the way that it views churches and allow a community to take it over? 
and create a new form of expression of religion in the community. I think that um, that's exactly what we're trying to discern is alternative ways in which we can uh, enable church buildings to be uh, connected and looked after in their communities, um, expecting those who worship at church to do all this is a really uh, ambitious thing uh, in, in a lot of cases. I think most of it comes down to communication and people talking to one another. And it's it's not uncommon for you know church um, congregations to not actually be talking or to be doing their stuff very quietly. And I think trying to enable conversations to go on in communities before we talk about closing buildings, to look at options, to make sure that the church centrally has a flexible approach. We have options, we have ways of enabling things to happen rather than simply being very kind of, well, it's either open or it's closed. I think that it is all about conversation and communication. The worst is when people get in, you know, we get the like, example you cited is when churches are threatened with closure and that suddenly means people are interested. And you think, well, where was that? Surely there's a way of enabling that interest earlier than putting a sailboard up or be, to be dramatic about it. So, yeah. Okay. So thank you. And uh, very briefly, um, Conta, we've got about three minutes left. Have we? Okay. Um, I just wanted to touch, and it follows on from that, actually, this 55 billion worth of social, is it social capital, the phrase? Um, if that is to happen and we want to enable people to take hold of their churches before it's too late, can we not get the government involved in this discussion so we have an honest and open discussion at, at a very high level um, so that we get MPs actually aware of the issues of, of, of churches in their local areas? I mean, we at Save the Parish have got a meeting to try and raise profile with, with MPs on the 15th of November this year, if it happens, um, it, which is supposed to. Uh, in order to, to try and raise the level up at, at the government level. I mean, we have bishops in the House of Lords and we have all sorts of, of, of people in, in who are voted into power who have to be aware of the social capital. And, and, um, and it's necessary to get funding to help these local communities change the way in which the church is treated. That's your job now, isn't it, Sir Philip? Part of it, maybe. I mean, I, I agree with you, um, Conta. Um, we do. Um, I think obviously we need to be sensitive to the fact that government's got any number of pressures on it and, and indeed the denominations have a number of pressures on them. But fundamentally, fundamentally, the buildings we're talking about, um, they're not all of the same, obviously not all of the same, don't all make the same, can't make the same case about every, every last one of them. But fundamentally, the buildings we talk about are buildings which are there providing public purpose. Yes, worship but also in many, many cases, looking after a fundamental part of the country's history and heritage and providing countless services, countless services to the people at large. And this public benefit is something that our public institutions should recognize, whether uh, UK government, uh, whether local government or in relation to Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, the devolved administrations. And they, they, some of them do, in truth, and some of them, some of them, I think, have been rather, rather distant from it. So yes, we need to make that case. We need to make it suitably. We need to make it cooperatively, but we do need to make that case. Thank you. And thank you so much, everybody. Um, I think I just take away that when we're talking about buildings, we're talking about people. Um, and um, I'm really grateful to you on this morning of all mornings for giving up an, an hour to, to be with us and discuss this really important topic. Um, if, you, if you're really into uh, self-punishment, there's another Zoom in an hour's time talking about this new government and uh, what it means um, to have uh, Rishi Sunak as our first Hindu prime minister. But for now, thank you ever so much. I really enjoyed that. I hope you found it useful. Thank you. <laughs>